Thank you everyone for coming on this evening. Um, we are just going to start with um, a welcome from Subir Singha and the South Asia Institute. Hi, welcome. As she said, I'm going to welcome you. So here, uh, welcome to all of you for this uh, first of the uh, events that we're doing with the South Asia Institute in terms of uh, discussions and seminars. Uh, very happy to start off with uh, this panel on Bangladesh. Uh, my name is Subir Sina, and uh, I hope all of you are on our mailing list. Uh, that is where we mostly publicize our events, but also we uh, put notice of our events on Twitter uh, under the South Asia Institute uh, handle. Uh, plus on uh, events uh, for, mm -hmm. if you went to the SOAS webpage and looked for events, uh, you'll see all the events that we have planned for you for the next uh, several weeks. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Samia because uh, it would be get to get the, good to get the proceeding started. Thanks very much and enjoy. So just to introduce myself, I'm Samia Khatun. I'm a senior lecturer here in the history department and it is absolutely delightful to have you all here and everyone who has joined us on Zoom as well. I'm going to keep my remarks really short because we're as expected already running behind time. Um, two stories, two historical stories about Bangladesh sometimes jostle for prominence and they seem at binary opposition to each other. One is that Bangladesh is a golden example of development success. Another is the idea that Bangladesh is a site of not just perpetual protest and rebellion, but also successful uprising. Now, both these stories actually have imperial origins, and you can trace them to the journals and diaries of East India Company officials, which is the period that I work on. And you might be surprised that the history of protest is also a colonial, um, has colonial origins. But in the earliest journals from the 18th century, when you start getting writers like Francis Buchanan and Warren Hastings and James Rennell in, the, uh, in, in East Bengal, what they're going to write about is a series of protests known as the Fakir Rebellions. And they're Fakirs or Shonnashis, and it's one of the major first rebellions about the new regime of colonial capital that the East India Company uh, are going to bring. And a thing that you really see across all these accounts of the Fakir Rebellions is that these people are described as carrying books with them. It's a detail that not many people have paid very much attention to. They're carrying books in the quote-unquote native scroll, sometimes books that are described as Arabian or Persian or Hindustani. They are, the protesters are, in fact, students. <laughs> they are students of various different knowledge traditions who in that early era are kicking off protest. Now, when in the two years, in 2017 to 2019, when I would get my students to think about these two different narratives, I would ask them, who constructs them? Who is the architect of them? Who does it actually um, help to have these narratives in power? Now, meanwhile, outside the classroom is where much of the learning was happening at that time because the student protests um, known as the transport movement, were underway. In many ways, both in the classroom and outside the classroom, we were learning about the various different silences that structured Bangladeshi society and the Bangladeshi history classroom. It is extremely um, exciting for a historian that a generation of students have refused to believe that there is no alternative story to the various binaries that have structured Bangladeshi society. So without further ado, I want to introduce our panellists to tell us about this moment and what we, from our various different um, backgrounds and facets of life, can learn and take from this moment. I'm going to actually introduce them uh, alphabetically because right until the last moment, we were still <laughs> discussing who's going to go first, who's going to go second. So Naomi Hussain joined the Department of Development Studies at SOAS in 2023 as a global research professor. She's a political sociologist interested in how people living with poverty and precarity get the public services they need. 
Naomi's work centers on two distinct but occasionally converging areas, the politics of Bangladesh's development and the contentious politics of public services and disasters. And this is work that has taken us far, taken her far beyond Bangladesh. Some of the many areas her work has examined include the elite perceptions of poverty, accountability for hunger, social protection, and inflationary price crises. And very importantly for today's program, the role of protest in holding public authorities to account. We've also got on our panel, Sarah Hussain, who is a barrister and has been practicing for 30 years in the areas of constitutional, corporate, and family law. Sarah is a partner at the law firm of Dr. Kamal Hussain and currently serves pro bono as the Honorary Executive Director of Bangladesh Legal Aid and Services Trust, or BLAST. Now, in 2022, Sarah was appointed chair of the Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Iran, established by the UN Human Rights Council to investigate the protests in Iran following the deaths in, death in custody of Gina Massa Amini. And we are particularly lucky at SOAS here to have Sarah at the moment as a professor of practice in the law faculty. Mushtaq Khan is a professor of economics here at SOAS. He is also head of the FCDO, which is a UK government funded anti corruption evidence research consortium. He is leading his leading thinking on developing analytical frameworks for assessing why institutions perform differently across countries. His broader research interests span effective policy implementation, governance, industrial policy, institutional economics, political economy, and anti-corruption. Mm -hmm. Mushtaq was in Dhaka right throughout the long July of 2024, interacting with students and student leaders. Today, he will be talking about how the last 15 years of rule has changed the political economy of the country. And we will be starting with Mushtaq today. So to, over to you. Uh, thanks, Samia. But first to say, I don't head the FCDO um, <laughs> because I have some friends from the FCDO sitting here. Um, but I'm, I head the SOAS ACE, which is the SOAS Anti-Corruption Evidence Research Consortium, which is funded by the FCDO. So just to correct that for my FCDO friends. Um, I want to give a very um, upbeat story about what has happened, partly because there's a lot of reasons for pessimism right now, but I'm someone, because I've perhaps been infected by the excitement of what was happening over the summer, I, I'm holding on to an extremely optimistic view of where we are and where we are going. And it's really up to us, Bangladeshis and our international friends and partners, to make this work. It's not going to work if we all sit back and say, this is really got lots of problems in front. Let me start by talking about Bangladesh's history and it's following on from what Samia said. If you look at the history of Bangladesh since 1947, it's actually a history of four uprisings. And each of these uprisings fundamentally changed the course of history. They fundamentally changed the direction in which the country was traveling. And according to the Bangladeshi Marxist um, historian Bodruddin Umar, the fourth and last, the 2024 uprising, is by far the more, most important one, is by far the most important one in terms of the potential changes of direction that will happen. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Umar's prognosis, whether it turns out or not, we'll have to see. The first uprising was, of course, the 1952 language uprising, from which Ekuje February began. That Although we celebrate that as a massive uprising, by today's token, it had a very limited death toll, but it was the end of the Muslim League in East Pakistan. The Muslim League did not recover, never came back. And it was the beginning of the mobilization for Bengali rights, for the rights of East Pakistan. The second uprising was the 1969 democratic uprising, the one that we call the Gono Bhutan. That was the beginning of the end of Pakistan. And that uprising had an estimated death toll of 61. And after that, there was no going back for Pakistan. It was the end of military rule. Elections were called. The results of the election 
were that the Awami League won an absolute majority in Pakistan. The West Pakistani elites did not accept that election, and the rest is history. The country then gradually moved into, uh, it became Bangladesh. Then there was the 1990 anti Ashada uprising. There, the death toll was around 50, and it was the end of Ashad's dictatorship and the end of the Jatiyo Party. Jatiyo Party has never come back into power. They've done a lot of mischief, and they have been on the peripheries of power, but they've never come back to power. That brings us to July. And in July, you have the anti-discrimination movement, which became an anti-fascist uprising. It's now described in both terms, both as an anti-fascist uprising, but also as the anti-discrimination uprising. The estimated death toll is about a, a thousand. What is going to change with this one? And I think that the one thing that is absolutely going to change and has changed is that the Awami hegemony in terms of ideology and the ideology of the nation and the ideology of the state, I think that is in tatters. And I think that is a really good thing that is in tatters because it has opened up the space for a lot of constructive, inclusive democratic politics, which was not possible as long as that exclusivist ideology of the Awami narrative was at in sway. And I'm going to spell that out, why that is so important in a second, and why it has changed. And, it has, and, you know, many of us were afraid that because of the misuse of this narrative of uh, secularism and, and um, of the, the, the liberation of 1971, that the attack on that would come from the right, would come from Islamists, would come from the, the usual sources. But in fact, what happened was that it was destroyed by an attack by progressive forces with a counter-narrative of what is a progressive future for Bangladesh. And I can't say how excited I am about that and how excited I am that we have been able to create that space for an inclusive democracy which goes beyond the Awami binary narrative. So it's, it's, I'm going to spend a bit of time explaining what this narrative is and why it was so toxic and so dangerous. And it's also therefore opened up a space for a new development strategy, which I think is more tenuous, but I think it is very hopeful that the concentration of power in the hands of a few crony capitalists and a few big players is potentially over. So how was democracy lost in Bangladesh? Very quickly, I think others will talk about this as, as well, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we... we know the broad outlines of what happened, I'm going to spend more time on why it happened. So in the 1990s, Bangladesh was in its democratic phase. We had two parties going in and out of power. It looked like a multi-party democracy, but it wasn't a usual democracy. And in my language of political settlements, and I describe this as competitive clientelism. There were two client list parties. These were patronage-based parties. They were highly corrupt, but they competed with each other and they shifted in and out of power every five years. This was not at all a well-working democracy. There was no strong rule of law. It was very, there was a lot of uh, corruption. There were substantial amounts of violence in the, at the periphery. But it was a big change from the Eshad um, autocracy, which was overthrown in 1990. And the cr critical thing about this period of competitive clientelism was that there were very strong horizontal checks between the two parties. No party could stay in power for long enough to destroy everything. So as soon as they came to power, they would try to politicize the judiciary, politicize the administration, politicize the police. But five years wasn't enough to completely politicize. There would still be people left within the judiciary, within the administration who belonged to the other party, and they would create a kind of automatic check on what could be done. There was looting, but entire banks could not be taken over and looted. Entire industries could not be um, taken over and, and um, politicized. That, therefore, was a period where the middle mattered. The middle, the intermediate classes, the SMEs, were powerful because both parties were competing for their support to stay in power and get in power. And that was when the growth of the garments industry and the labor-intensive industries in Bangladesh took off. 
And I don't think it's a surprise that the growth of the garments industry in the 1990s had the characteristics it did in Bangladesh. The characteristics it had in Bangladesh was that it was job creating, it was very job labor intensive, the share of manufacturing in Bangladesh, the female participation in Bangladesh was higher than in India. And, and that growth, and when people talk about the Bangladesh miracle, they're talking about that period of growth where you had a lot of jobs, a lot of participation, and poverty levels went down because of an inclusive growth strategy. And this inclusive growth strategy was underpinned by the fact that SMEs had the power to get things like gas supplies, to get things like um, licenses and get access to land because the, the, the two major parties were competing for their support and they belonged to both parties. And this is a really important um, interlinkage between the type of politics and the type of economics we had. This begins to change after 2006 in a very adverse way. And the political settlement, which I describe as a distribution of power in society, that distribution of power becomes more and more concentrated. Why does this happen? Well, the first thing that happens was that the two parties failed to institutionalize electoral rules for organizing elections. And I think this is the, the, the whole story of the caretaker system, which I'm not going to go into because most of you know the story. These were really not rule-following parties. They were both very corrupt. They were both pretty violent. And they could not institutionalize a form of organizing the elections that would in, in, ensure that there was a modicum of fairness in how the votes were organized and counted. That resulted in the emergency of 2007 to 8, which was the turning point. Because that emergency tried to do too much. It tried to do a lot of reforms. And by trying to do too much, it not only didn't do anything, it actually made things worse. Because it tried to, for example, it tried to weed out all corruption in society. It picked up everybody and tried to have an anti-corruption drive. It tried to pick up politicians, bureaucrats, not so much bureaucrats, but certainly uh, businessmen. And all these cases failed because in the end, no one would come and really give the evidence that was required. To cut a long story short, that resulted in a very large Awami League victory in 2009. And part of the story behind that is that Sheikh Hasina, who was a very adept politician, gave indemnity to the military who were behind this um, uh, emergency, and Khalid Azia did not. And so that was one reason why people think that the victory of the Awami League was even bigger than it might have been otherwise. And I've spoken to a lot of people, we are doing some research on this, and talking to a lot of um, people who were in, in different positions during that period. When the Awami League won, I'm going really fast because this is not my, my, my interest. I have... I want to go somewhere with this. The, when the Awami League won, it used its majority, as we all know, it abolished the caretaker system, but it did something more than that. It ramped up what I call the Awami narrative and used that to break down all opposition organizations in a really successful way. And this included attacks on religious parties, on Hefazat, on the Jamaat, the so-called um, uh, the war crimes trials where people were hanged. Basically, it created a climate of fear that anybody who was against the Awami narrative was not only fair game, was potentially a Razakar, that is a collaborator of 71, could potentially be picked up and could be disappeared. And the disappearances began, the so-called Aina Ghor and the, kind of the House of Mirrors began, the uh, disappearances and, and mysterious um, absences began. This, all of this was underpinned by silencing large chunks of society with a narrative. And this narrative is really important for us to understand because I think that, you know, it didn't just happen in abstract. There was a justification for what they were doing. And even though many people or almost everyone knew the justification was a lie and a mistake and, a, and, and wrong, they didn't open their mouth against it. And why they didn't open their mouths against it is itself very interesting. That process of breaking up the opposition and instilling fear in the population resulted in what I call a vulnerable authoritarianism. An authoritarianism that is a government that could stay in power 
because it didn't face challenge, but it didn't face challenge because it was very successful in breaking up the opposition. It's not that it didn't face challenge because everyone was supporting it. It didn't face challenge because it was very effective in breaking up every opposition, every incipient attempt at organizing an opposition. What is this Awami narrative that could not be questioned? And I think that we all know this, but I just wanted to list up a, a, a list of things because we've become kind of immune to this, but it's completely unnatural. The first point is that it, it begins with the history of, of Pakistan. Pakistan was created by a two-nation theory of the Muslim League, which partitioned India, which is partly true, but actually not entirely true, because the partition of India, as we know from a lot of revisionist histories, was also driven by Congress's intransigence and the inability of Congress to accommodate the Muslims within one India until the last minute, till the very last minute in 1946, Jinnah was trying to keep India together, and the Bengal Muslim League actually voted in 1946 to keep Bengal together, and the Hindu minority voted to partition Bengal. Now, these other details are just whitewashed out, and we are told Pakistan was created by the two-nation theory, uh, two theory. Okay, fine. Then we are told Bangladesh, uh, the Bengalis of East Pakistan began to fight for independence in 1952 based on Bengali nationalism, which is partially true, there was a movement from 1952, but it was, a, not a, it was not a movement for independence. It was a movement for regional rights and East Pakistani rights. And the vast majority of East Pakistanis did not go over to an independence mode till 1971. So this is again like 19... Okay, I'm not going to go through it in great detail because I think most of you know this stuff. That 1971, the victory was achieved by the Awami League and everybody else was implicitly supporting Pakistan. If you weren't Awami League, you were suspect. Well, this is partly true. Awami League won the election of 1970. It was on that basis of that election that the conflict started. But in fact, when the repression began, the entire leadership of Awami League ran away to India, as they have done again. And the people who fought in Bangladesh were not the Awami Leaguers. There were other people, including people like Zia, who never belonged to the Wami League. Then you have the story of the three million who were killed, which is an exceptionally large number, which has never been verified, and almost everyone agrees is a bit of an exaggeration. And if you have managed to kill three million people in nine months, there must be a huge number of collaborators and Razakars out there under every rock who need to be weeded out and rooted out. You don't kill three million people in nine months unless you have millions of collaborators who are helping the Pakistanis do this. Okay, you challenge that, you were in very deep, deep trouble. And then India has a permanent special status as a friendly country, Bundurashtra. Oh. Now this special status of India means that it has carte blanche to intervene in your country, do whatever it wants, because as a friendly country, by definition, it can't do anything unfriendly. Now, of course, again, partly true, India played a critical role in 1971 in the liberation of Bangladesh, but India's role in 1971 was entirely driven by its own national interests. It wanted to split Pakistan, and at that point, India's interest was exactly aligned with the East Pakistani Bangladeshi interest, which was to get independence because Pakistan was not recognizing a democratic election. So at that moment, India's interests and Bangladesh's interest was aligned, but it doesn't mean that forever and a day, India's interests and Bangladesh's interests are the same. But you can't criticize that. People have actually disappeared under the Awami League into the Ainagar for saying, maybe India is not acting in Bangladesh's interests. Then you have Mujib was killed in 1975 by supporters of Pakistan who later formed BNP. Mujib was indeed killed in 1975, but he was not killed by supporters of Pakistan. He was killed by freedom fighters who took offense at his attempt to set up a one-party state. And then finally, there's the idea that this is an existential conflict between BNP and Jamaat who are going to bring back Pakistan, Taliban, IS, and, and so on, and Awami League, who is the only guarantee of keeping the spirit of 1971 and independence. This is the Awami narrative. This Awami narrative in different forms has been fed by a very powerful machine, unstoppable machine, but actually it turns out nobody has believed it because the day the Awami League left, this whole narrative has gone up in smoke. 
And the sad thing is that many secular intellectuals went along with this narrative, knowing that it was fake, knowing that it was false, on the grounds that the opposition wasn't very attractive. And by the way, if they use this to pick up the opposition, why does it matter to me? This kind of failure of the progressive intell intellectuals of Bangladesh is part of the reason why we ended up where we did. And I think that what I'm going to come to later on in a bit is that what happened in July and August of, 19, of this year is and it emerged that actually under the radar, there has been a churning and a creation of an alternative progressive narrative. And it's because of that alternative progressive narrative that in fact, the students and their allies could not be shaken up and broken down by all the propaganda of communalism and genocide against Hindus and Razakars and everything that was thrown totally failed this time. So it is very, I think it's a really exciting story. Okay, so then what happens? That narrative allows the Awami League to destroy the opposition and political power becomes gradually more and more concentrated because the opposition simply cannot operate. It doesn't exist. And that concentration of power allows the, the, the ruling party to take over not just businesses, but banks and um, big corporations. And power becomes more and more concentrated in a few hands. And this change in the distribution of power the concentration of power in the hands of a small number of big capitalists results in a number of things. Firstly, the SME sector stagnates. There is growth, but no new industries emerge, no new garments industries emerge, and even the middle-sized garments industries decline and the big ones start growing. Some of it could be natural, but some of it was deliberately because of the access to gas, access to banking, access to resources, which the big capitalists had and the small and medium capitalists lost. A new development model emerged, which was based on building overpriced infrastructure. So the roads, bridges, and, and so on, the metros, and power investments, which were significantly overpriced. All of this resulted in headline paper growth rates, which were high, but even that was slightly massaged and overstated. But the reality of it was that this was jobless growth. This was not growth that was creating new sectors and new jobs, and that is at the heart of the student revolt. And the authoritarian party, which, did, which described itself as a developmental state modeled along the Chinese model and so on, actually totally lacked the internal discipline to control the corruption of its own members, its own factions. There was a huge non-repayment of bank loans, overpriced power projects, illicit capital flight. All of this is now coming out in, I mean, and, and the reality turns out to be even more desperate than we thought. The extent of looting was unprecedented in our own, the SOAS ACE research, which we have done on the power sector. We showed that just on the power sector, the overpriced contracts resulted in a billion dollars a year of excess subsidy given to these power plants. The money embezzled from banks and sent abroad is estimated currently by the Bangladesh Bank at more than $8 billion. It might increase. This is just the, the money that has been sent out. In, in Around 10% of bank loans are non-performing. In most countries, this would result in a banking collapse. Bangladesh doesn't have that uh, problem because our people are not that sophisticated in terms of panicking when they see these figures. And I mean, Islamic Bank, which has probably got 20% non-performing loans, uh, the trusting citizens of Bangladesh, because it is called Islamic Bank and it has a long history, they keep putting their money into the Islamic Bank. This is what is keeping the system going. It's based on trust and long may that survive. But actually, the money has been taken out of these banks by the cronies, and much of it is sitting in London and places like that. So we're going after that. And then just to give you kind of final kind of example, just a few days before Sheikh Hasina fled, she proudly proclaimed that she was taking action against her peon. Her peon is her like her office boy in her house. And she says, you know, and she's like Mary Antoinette, you know, saying that you don't have bread, you can have cake. She's thinking, she's calming us down by saying, I'm taking this very strong action against my peon who has stolen $40 million. And people were asking, well, I don't care that you're taking action against your, your peon. 
The question is, how did your peon get access to $40 million and how much have you made? Anyway. Then comes the uprising. Why, how did this happen? And I think others will talk about it, so I'm weak, I'll be quick here. Um, this kind of oppressive regime, huge concentration of power, massive looting going on. And by the way, it's not that we only found out about the looting now. We knew about the looting right through and there were newspaper articles, pe people writing academic pieces and so on. Why did it survive? Is because there was no opposition organization and everybody else was silenced by fear. The crisis was triggered actually by something which most people missed. There was a growing financial crisis and then Hasina is playing off India and China and promising things to both. And at one point, it gets caught out. So China wants to build this dam on the Bangladesh side of the Tista River, which is very close to the seven uh, to the Chicken's Neck, which is connecting India to the Seven Sisters. She goes to India, and Modi tells her, "You have to cancel that." She then immediately cancels this. She comes back and she announces, the government announces, China is our development friend and India is our political friend. <laughs> And China says, hmm, that's not nice. We are giving you money and you're going to be a pro-Indian. So then when she goes to, a couple of days later, she flies to China to get another $5 billion of money um, authorized. China, does, I mean, Xi Jinping does the extreme insult that a Chinese leader can do to you. He doesn't meet her. And he doesn't give her the $5 billion. And she comes back without that money. And that is the beginning of the crisis. Because if you want to understand why something relatively simple like a quota movement was suppressed with such violence and such, I mean, huge violence, is because the regime knew that there was going to be a series of opposition and, and movement because of the growing financial crisis. And they had to establish that you cannot stand up against us. So they had to put it down with great force. Okay, so this is the background. I think it's not just an, uh, a kind of, you know, the, the pictures of this extreme violence that was used against the students doesn't make sense otherwise. The student protests were about quotas, but this time the violent repression on them had exactly the opposite effect. And it had the opposite effect because, and I'm going to come to this now, the students had been mobilizing for a very long time, not just about organization, but about ideas. And ideas are really important in terms of how you construct coalitions of very diverse forces. Because what happened in, in July is that what started with public university students immediately brought out private university students who had no direct connection with the quota movement, brought out school and college students who had nothing to do with quota movements, then brought out madrasa students who had absolutely nothing to do with this, and this whole coalition, and then increasingly ordinary citizens and ordinary people of different persuasions, and all of these people were able to work together without being split because there was a new narrative. And that new narrative was a fundamental rupture with the Awami narrative, which I'm going to come to. So this collective action is something which is remarkable. And I've spent some time talking to students and student leaders and trying to, and it's a, that's what gives me optimism. This is not just an accident. There is a real well of activity going on at the grassroots level in Bangladesh, which is, which is massive, it's, it's huge, and it's not reversible anytime soon. And I think this is what gives me a lot of confidence. Okay, so these are the iconic pictures. You know, it starts with a spark. This man, Abu Said, stood in front of bullets. And you, I mean, there's a video. I mean, I'm, it's, it's too horrible to show. But a few seconds later, he's shot repeatedly and he dies. But this becomes the iconic picture of the movement. And this brings out everybody. I mean, it brings out girl students, females, madrasa students, private university students, public, everybody gets involved because fear finally goes. Abu Said gave them the image of what it is to fight. And there were repeatedly, repeatedly pictures of young men, sometimes women, 
standing in exactly that pose in front of police um, uh, guns. And here is the really interesting thing. The Awami narrative finally stopped working fully and completely when Sheikh Hasina took out that old trope of the Razakar. Mm. And this, and, and so it's really important to understand why this fails, right? Where this person's kind of this uh, uh, thing hanging in front is saying, the people who called us Razakars come from a long line of autocrats. It sounds much nicer in Bengali, it rhymes. Okay, so that statement was not random. And it's not random that within hours of Sheikh Hasina saying this, similar slogans were coming up all across Bangladesh. It was primed to happen. So I, now I want to just, the, the most important part of what I want to say is, <laughs> two minutes, Havana. I'm going to talk a little bit more because we have time. So what is this huge change? And I think that the roots of this change, I'm going to be quick because I'm told I don't have time, but this is really interesting, so we should have another seminar later on. We have one on Wednesday. <laughs> but that's not econo that's economics. Yeah, so this is so what is what has happened is that the students have rediscovered our own intellectual history. And this own intellectual history goes back to a man called Abdul Razak, who was the um, national professor of Bangladesh, made the national professor by Awami League, who never understood what he was talking about. And Abdul Razak's 1940 book. Um, in the written in the 1940s called Political Parties in India, is a precursor to Aisha Jalal, precursor to um, uh, Perry Anderson, precursor to all the revisionist histories. Because Abdul Razak says, actually, that the problem of, of India at that time was its political parties were all representing sectional interests and Congress was driving the partition of India. Now, I'm, I don't want to have to go into this in greater detail, but this is a really profound book. Okay, Then you have Badruddin Umar, the Marxist, who has been writing since the 1960s, giving a different interpretation of communalism and, giving, and, and, and quite rightly pointing out that the roots of this communism are as much in, in India as in Pakistan or, or Bangladesh. And, in, 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 and of course, in his uh, writing is to do with class and, and class structures. Ahmad Sofa is another powerful intellectual whose Bengali Muslim mind was a kind of foundational uh, book and a foundational piece of writing. A philosopher, a poet, his work has in inspired a lot of people in, in uh, contemporary Bangladesh. Taj Hashmi's work on Bangladesh, I can't resist in, as a very periphery putting in my own work <laughs> on partitions and nationalisms. All of this work is showing that the complexity of how Bangladesh emerged and how Bangladesh became what it is. And you can't, uh, so the fundamental point here is that you can't explain the geography of Bangladesh, the map of Bangladesh, without taking into account the fact that it is Muslim and Bengali. You, if it was just Bengali, it would not exist. It would have become part of India. So the fact that whether you want to be secular or not, and we all want to be secular, even if you want to be secular, you have to recognize the Muslim Bengali identity of Bengal of Bangladesh to understand its existence. This is the, the history of, of, of that, those ideas. Then you have people like Salimullah Khan. Now you get to the really mass ex, you know, exposition, which is on YouTube. And YouTube has played a role in this movement, which is beyond belief. So people like Salimullah Khan have taken these ideas uh, and the debate between Razak and Safa and, and others. And Salimullah Khan made this mass on, on, on YouTube. Pinaki Bhattacharya, some of his work, uh, his YouTube is abrasive. But when Pinaki does his history, and Pinaki writes about the communal relationships and the history of Bangladesh and the history of India, it is extremely well done. So if you go back a year or two and look at Pinaki's um, uh, YouTube broadcast on history, outstanding and completely in line with this um, Kanak Sarwar in, in the US, Zahidur Rahman and Zahid Stake in Bangladesh, these YouTubers took history and made history accessible to a new generation. And finally, the final product of this was these ideas filtered, filter out, and then you have people like Mahfuz Alam, the, one of the key student leaders who come in. If you can read Bengali or understand Bengali, please follow Mahfuz Alam and people like that. This is where the kind of, it's, it's clear where all of this has come together 
And then people like Mahuzalam are talking about imagining a new Bangladesh, a Bangladesh that is secular, which is inclusive, but which has a space for Islamic politics and which recognizes the Muslim heritage of, Beng of Bengal and which wants relationships with countries based on mutual interests and transparency, not on permanent friends or permanent enemies. You cannot imagine how big and revolutionary a change this is. It doesn't sound big. Believe me, this is a revolution. The narrative has changed and these young people will not be fooled again. I can't see them being fooled again. And, and if you just go to meeting after meeting after meeting and the discussions that are happening, this is not just a few people. So, the students announced. I'm just give me a couple of minutes. I, I want to just end on a... So the students announced the government would fall in July. It was almost the end of July. So they said, said we might extend July. <laughs> but she will fall in July. At that point, the whole country fell in love with the students. She will fall in July and we will extend July and she will fall in July. So this is this is one of the kind of by the early by early August, the whole country was in celebration mode. This is from Chiragong. And there are scenes like this in every city in Bangladesh. So basically what, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Just be, as this was happening, end of July, the young army officers declare they are not going to shoot on the crowds. That was the real turning point. And the scenes where young people were jumping onto APCs and tanks and catching hold of soldiers and saying, you can't shoot at us. They were reminiscent of every revolution. You know, you have these old images of uh, the Russian revolution, very similar things. And that had an effect. That had an effect because a young officer said, we won't shoot. This was leaked out. The 36th of July, there was a long march on Dhaka and she fled. Now, the last slide. Really ask you to. <laughs> I'm going to do the last slide. But I think, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, yeah. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Let it. Go for it. Two minutes. This is the last slide. I'll cut so what is the problem now going forward? So a huge change has happened. But what is my my problem with the UNIS government is that it is not acting like a revolutionary government. It is acting like a caretaker government. It is not a caretaker government. It is confused by its own language of having advisors and so on. These are not advisors. They're not, who are they advising? They're ministers. They are an emergency government outside the constitution. The constitution was destroyed on the, or suspended on the 5th of August because the constitution does not say what to do if the prime minister and all the ministers and all your capitalists and all your bureaucrats run away. <laughs> There's no nothing in the constitution about what you're supposed to do. So they're not acting like so, And this is where I think strong executive action, acting like a revolutionary government, had they immediately gone and caught killers on video, the, the ones who were on video shooting, had picked them up, the law and order situation would have been a lot better. Instead, people are taking the law into their own hands. Uh, Sarah will talk a lot more about that. The other thing is that I think that they have to take strong executive action and they are taking this action. There's a lot of pressure from below, from students, from the street. 
and they're responding to it, but not fast enough. What they have to do is sell assets to recover defaulted loans. There is a huge pressure on this. The Bangladesh Bank said it, it wants to do it, but it is not setting up the executive process to do it. And this is not about all the defaulted loans. You can't do that because almost everyone is a defaulter in Bangladesh. You have to do it with the top 10, the politically exposed people who ripped out the banks, who took thousands of crores of taka of loans with no intention of repaying it. You should identify the top politically exposed people. You should identify their assets, sell them, and recover some of this money to the banks. It has to renegotiate or cancel the odious contracts in the power sector. I've said how big these amounts are, billion dollars a year. Adani, without selling much power to Bangladesh, has given a bill of $800 million. Okay, these are things that need to be looked at and action has to be taken very fast. We have to start proceedings to recover stolen assets from abroad. Again, the Bangladesh Bank has started this process. There are things happening in the UK, but it has to happen very fast by setting up executive processes, leadership on the Bangladesh side pushing this. And we have to reset foreign relations by publishing secret international treaties and asking our friends in India that we are not anti-Indian, we are not, it's not communal, it's not anti-Hindu, it's just these are terribly unequal contracts. I haven't had time to talk about that, but we can in, in the conversation why they're so bad. And so let me end on this really positive note. A huge opportunity has opened up and a small number of strong executive steps could unlock this, could, sorry, could lock this in and could stabilize a distribution of power which is more equal, which is more towards the middle and which is more egalitarian. And what the students want and what people in Bangladesh want is an inclusive democratic politics which recognizes both the Muslim and the Bengali history of Bangladesh and which is inclusive of all types of opinions, but within a broad framework of secularism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mushtaq. Like July, your talk went on for too long, but nobody is complaining. <laughs> Over to you, Naomi. Well, uh, unlike, unlike Mushtaq Pai, I spent the summer in London on Twitter, and I feel much less positive. It might be a causal Twitter, I think, might be the reason. But um, And it's funny because, you know, I have, we have a mutual friend, uh, Dr. Mirza Hassan, who's um, he was a a chronically um, pessimistic person who always can see the worst side and everything. And we joke that I'm the, the sunshine and he's the rain, but he he is also very optimistic. So I think that, you know, you're onto something here. Thank you so much. So um, thank you very much to Sabir and uh, the South Asia Institute and to Sunil and Samia and to our lovely panelists. So I study protests and the politics of development. So that was very useful for this past monsoon, and I wanted to share my analysis um, about what I think has happened and, and what I think might happen in, in the future in Bangladesh. I've organized these thoughts into triggers, causes, and responses. And each of these themes, I think, illustrates my central point, which is that the ongoing political crisis in Bangladesh is the consequence of an extreme concentration of power, which we have heard about. Uh, but therefore, ways of dispersing and distributing that power more justly and democratically and accountably will need to be at the heart of any reform efforts. Um, I also wanted to say something about protest movements. Um, oh, look, my notes are there. That's great. Um, it is actually very, very difficult, practically and theoretically, to make sense of uh, the uprising, the, the specific moments of the uprising for several reasons. One is that there were many moments, many protests, many related events, uh, clashes and violence and riots and reprisals, possibly hundreds of thousands, maybe more protesters. There were many individual perspectives. Partly that's about positionality. Partly that's about ideology. Um, I saw it with my own eyes. I think several people in this room were on some of these protests. Um, but that's always a guarantee of truth that you saw with your own eyes. These were very emotional and emotive events, very angry and very upsetting, very shocking. Even sitting in London on Twitter, it was shocking and upsetting. Uh, and so memories can be very distorted under such circumstances. Um, and then finally, of course, there was a huge amount of disinformation from from in, mostly from India, it seems. So it is actually quite difficult to make sense of this movement. And we need to, anyone who says that they know exactly what happened is, is fooling themselves. And I think we need to study this from multiple 
disciplinary and participant perspectives, uh, keep in mind that people are still reinterpreting the American and French revolutions uh, 250 years later. Um, so the lens that I've been using to make sense of this movement is that of contentious politics, which is a field of political sociology. We study protests and social movements and all kinds of extra institutional politics. And we sometimes talk about triggers as distinct from causes when it comes to protest movements. And in particular, when we're talking about protest movements that escalate or scale shift, which means they go from being about one issue, quite localized, quite a kind of specific group in a specific place, and then they escalate into a much bigger national issue about many, many issues, uh, sorry, involving many, many people and uh, really start to be questioning really the fundamentals of political power. Um, and that's what happened here. Um, and it's really important to talk about triggers or sparks because they help us to understand why some protests escalate while others do not. Bangladesh had had previous student movements as the road safety um, Samia mentioned the private university fees and the quota movement had a previous round. And these were large, they were important. They had a lot of the hallmarks of a successful movement, but none of them were entirely successful and none of them had that scale shift. None of them turned from being about one issue to being about many issues, about challenging government, the government to the regime itself. So only in bloody July did, did scale shift occur. So what happened? So how can we understand what turned a student movement into an uprising that overthrew a really, a really um, powerful ruler? So I've been looking at the um, I've been looking at uh, the ACLED data, ACLED is armed conflict location event data to try and make sense of what's been going on. There's a there's a, a rogue um, arrow there. I'm not quite sure why that's there. Um, and uh, I tried to be clear and a bit more evidence-based in, in, in my analysis. It's a very good data set. It's probably the best there is. Um, and this graph shows you the number and types of protests in the, in the six weeks, the crucial six weeks between July and August the 4th. Um, as you can see, it starts off quite peaceful. Start, there are a lot of clashes and then the solidarity protests by non-student groups, which is very important in, in growing a movement, expanding a movement. Um, happens. And there are these, these peaks and troughs, as you can see. So those are the moments at which the triggers occur. And um, those are the, oh yeah, that's why I've got those funny arrows. Um, those are the peak moments where things really kick off. So what were these triggers? Well, like I mentioned, uh, this is one. Uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina made her very ill-judged, but most politically costly, sarcastic comments, um, probably in history, about students wanting the government jobs to go to Razakas. On July the 15th, if you go back to that, you can see the date. July the 15th, the Bangladesh Chhatra League starts attacking Dhaka University students. There were bombs or some kind of devices um, let off. Um, and of course, on July 16th, we, Abu Saeed was shot. And I actually did re-watch that video today. Um, don't watch it, it's really awful. Um, so the first trigger, the Prime Minister's comments reflect, among other things, a degree of arrogance that must have come from an absence of dissent and critique in public discourse, that really high degree of comfort they were feeling, she was feeling after this election of January. Um, and also, of course, a sense of of ownership, that she owned this all-important ideology of national liberation, that she and the Awami League were the final arbiter of the truth of the liberation war. And I think attacks by the Bangladesh Chhatra League reflect the criminal impunity of ruling party aligned groups. And the callous shooting of Abu Sayyid and other protesters reflected the degree to which the ruling party was willing to do anything at this point to hold on to power. They had secured control of the security forces and they had no expectation that the movement was going to resist further. It was a sense of total power and control at this stage. They really did not think that anything was, they were going to back down like they always had done before. And um, by the end of July, we are seeing a mass movement emerge and grow and protests from across the political groupings, even looking through the data, it, it seems that even 
some pro Awami League university teachers and other groups were coming out in support of the protesters. The protests spread across the country. And the trigger or the spark appears to have been the, the horror of the unrestrained violence against the pro protesters. It became clear that the regime was not going to, there was nothing, nothing would stop them. They would hold on to power at all costs. The reason for that, of course, is that the stakes were so very, very high. So there are four indicators of this scale shift that happened. One is the numbers of protests. There were about 700 events in those long six weeks. Uh, they were spread across different occupation groups. They were spread across the country. Uh, I, I calculated uh, something like 123 thanas or wards had events. That's like, if it's 464, somebody who can do mental arithmetic, it's a lot, right? It's a high proportion of tunnels in the country had um, protests. That's that's a really remarkable ge geographical spread, very, very rare. And the nature of demands, of course, shifted from quota reforms to the resignation of the government. So this is a, this is why you went from a protest movement to a, a regime-changing uprising. Um, Mushtaq Bhai mentioned some of these causes. I don't want to go into these in particular detail because Mushtaq Bhai has already done so. Youth unemployment, um, particularly, I think, the mismatch between young people's aspirations, um, all this talk about Bangladesh success and, you know, new tiger and growth and blah, blah, and actually people couldn't get jobs. Um, but also this uh, the corruption uh, scandals that have been so, um, so horrific in Bangladesh. And uh, I think one thing that was not widely noticed was that there was also corruption around the civil service exams. And Rafid Hussain, who's you can put your hand up at the back there. So uh, SOAS Development Study student wrote an excellent blog about this. It's on our website. On our website, um, There was corruption in the civil service exams, and that was definitely part of the motivation for the quota reform movement. Both of these causes reflect the centralization of power in the Awami League regime. They reflect an absence of accountability, a willingness by the regime to let their key supporters do whatever they like. They could just do whatever they like um, instead of doing governance and development. But less attention has been paid, and I think this is really crucial, to the underlying economic grievances that many Bangladeshis had at this time. Um, and uh, this only really starts around the summer of 2022. So when Murshtaq Pai talks about deep discontent going back many years, I don't think the evidence really supports the view that people were very discontented on the whole until relatively recently. Um, thousands of people did come out in support of BNP-led protests late 22 um, around the cost of living. Um, but they didn't come out for the election-related protests, perhaps because they were, you know, being shot and disappeared at that point. But I think that I think there is a difference there. And I think it's important to note that, the, you know, the, the movement itself was led for, by very middle class people who don't worry quite as much where their next meal is coming from. Um, and I don't think they've given this issue enough attention. It's definitely clear the care to the interim government is not worrying too much as much about this as they really need to. I think inflation remains a serious problem in Bangladesh. Sorry, it's, it's, it's changed. I don't know what's happened to the slides. But anyway, one of the reasons I say this is that there were there's, there's been a series of national perception surveys by the BRAC Institute of Governance and Development and the Asia Foundation going back many years, repeated at regular intervals. And often in the past, when we've received these results, we've been a bit surprised at the resilience of the support for the Awami League, which is, after all, a very violent and increasingly fascistic um, political organization. Um, but even after COVID in 2021, we saw this really quite a lot of support for the for the regime and, and a, a kind of sense of optimism. We were always surprised about this. Um, but by late 2022, that had really changed. And I think the cost of living crisis has, has played a, a big part of that. So while the problems of economic development were a grievance here, I think it's actually maybe overstated until 2022. I think at this point, it really does start to become a serious problem for Bangladesh, for, for, for the majority of the population in Bangladesh. Um, by 2023, Bangladesh was absolutely a totally closed political space. There was no civic space. Um, the government had brutally suppressed the political opposition, labor movements, anyone who was not wholly heartedly their, wholeheartedly their ally. Um, and I think it's really important to note here that the Awami League regime relied on its economic performance for its political legitimacy, what we call performance legi legitimacy. And when that performance failed, started to fail very, very plainly and clearly in 2022, it lost its legitimacy and then it just shot and disappeared the people who were trying to hold it to account. 
I think it's very crucial also the Awami League presided over this this fusion of the party with the state. How, about, how much this fusion of the party with the state? They took over the civil service, the police, the local government, big business, army, uh, to some extent the army anyway, and and civil even civil society and the media were, were were captured or aligned. So it looked like an unbeatable concentration of power, and it was up until that very moment when the army declined to shoot any more young people. That was the moment when it all changed. A few words um, about what I think needs to happen now. Um, this is Bangladesh is one of the most centralized states in the world. And for the eighth biggest nation, 175, 80 million people, that's that's a lot of pressure on any state, on any central state um, to deliver any, any goods, development, governance, whatever you like, law and order. But we also have a winner-takes-all political system. So if you win an election, you get everything. You get everything and you get to stick your opponent in jail. So that's not very healthy either. And this has been really, really good for ruling parties seeking to stay in power. I have a slightly different memory of the 2006 period and indeed the 1990s to you, uh, Mushtaq Pai. I don't remember that the BNP were very keen on democracy and I do remember the Awami League trying a little bit harder. Um, and certainly 2006 felt, for those of us who were there at the time living through it, Sarah, you'll remember, felt a lot like this, but with much less violence. Felt a lot like 2024. And uh, anyway, I don't think a rotation of parties in power will ever produce democracy in Bangladesh. It will change the faces at the top. And that's not going to be enough to produce democracy. I do think, and this is kind of important and the, the slide has disappeared, but I think it says democracy entails the dispersal of power, a democratization of power. Um, in Bangladesh, beyond the, the the center, and I don't think right now we're likely to have that. It entails the dispersal of power away from the center. Um, it won't be enough to have new parties because the concentration of power in, in Bangladesh has become so great. These are my re reform priorities: disperse power somehow. I don't have the answers to how. I have some answers, but. One way to do that is to definitely reduce the spoils of electoral victory, make it less attractive to win, make it less horrible to lose. There must be ways of doing this. Um, I know people are talking about electoral system reform. I'm not sure that's the answer either, or not that alone. Um, I do believe, though, that citizens need to have power um, in non-parliamentary um, institutions. Uh, and there are these provisions and there are these resources that already exist in Bangladesh that can be activated. I have a feeling, I'm feeling a little bit of deja vu, like I've seen this movie before. Um, I'm not feeling all that happy. This was a this is a, a cartoon from 2007, 2008. Um, you know, jail all the politicians or one side anyway and and hope for change. I don't know. It doesn't feel very likely to me. Um if anyone can do it though, I think um, you know, the 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 people who are there at present have have the um the motivation to do it. Uh, ending here, an extreme centralization of power explains the movement. And here, Moshe Pai and I are, I think, on the same page. Dispersing power will be difficult and very contentious, um, even though provisions do exist in the law and in the policy regime. Um, and also the, the social organizational capacities also exist in Bangladesh. We have an incredibly rich array of social organizations of very various kinds. I don't use the language of civil society anymore in relation to Bangladesh because that's become a dirty word, but that's basically what we're talking about is all kinds of community-based organizations, clubs, think tanks, policy advocacy groups, universities, and so on. Oh, and NGOs. So these exist. They're pretty well organized uh, or have been. They've been a bit decimated in the last decade, but they do exist. The interim government really needs ideas, support, and it needs time, and it doesn't have time because already the legitimacy is waning, I think in particular around the cost of living crisis. So we've got to keep our fingers crossed and be very hopeful and supportive, but at the same time alert to the, the threats and the challenges. And that's me. You've saved some time.
Thank you so much, Naomi. And it's really wonderful to hear, even amongst our panellists, um, jostling narratives of history being articulated because now we can. <laughs> Over to you, Sarah. To be fair, we always did in sitting here, don't you think? Academics always did. And then? I've not really heard the the kind of um, narratives that Mushtaq Khoi was actually um, articulating up there. I haven't actually heard for a very, very, very long time, apart from enclosed, behind closed doors, I have to myself say, but over to you, Sarah. Okay, so I'm the last speaker and I realise everyone will be flagging and also wanting to ask their question because my friends are saying they're not flagging, that's good. <laughs> but I also don't have slides to keep your attention, so I hope you'll just listen to me. And, and find it of interest. I want to, I'm not being a professor, just a professor of practice, which means a person who does work during the day and doesn't theorize and think a lot. I, I'm not going to be able to do the kind of eloquence that Mushtaq and Naomi have done, um, but I'm going to focus my remarks um, a bit more narrowly. Um, not a great deal more, but definitely stay away from the politics and economics and talk about justice and equality. Um, but maybe before starting, I just want us to recall for a minute um, because I think in our Bangladesh conversations, we're really forgetting this completely about where we are now compared to where we were barely three months ago. Um, we're all of a certain age up here on this panel for you younger people out there. So we have all just about as children lived through 1971. There are others here who've experienced it as adults. We also lived through and were part of the 1990 movement against Rishad and their friends here from that time. And of course, we've lived through and been part of this last few months and, and many more years. So in independent Bangladesh, where we've been adults, we have never seen this kind of violence under civilian rule. Of course, there was the genocide of 71, but as I said, we were not adults then. We didn't witness it in the same way. Of course, there were secret killings, maybe thousands of them in military cantonments in the 70s. Again, we didn't witness that directly. But now in those few weeks, we saw shootings on the streets, not one day, not two days, day after day after day. I heard firing from my home. I heard firing from my office. I heard firing pretty much from wherever I went. There were arbitrary arrests and detention of thousands of people, people as young as many of the students who are in this room and younger school students. There was an internet shutdown of days, not just hours, days. There were curfews endlessly of all of the, during these days. There were tortures of students. Uh, I don't know if there are law students in this room. Law students, young barristers, law teachers, beaten with rods on the floor of a police station, not in a remote part of Bangladesh, in Shah Bagh, right in the center of the city, on the last day, on the fifth, hours before Sheikh Hasina fled the country. All of this happening with the direction and planning of high officials. That's where we were. It was just a few weeks ago, just a few months ago. It's really easy to forget because right now, as I said, in Bangladesh, we're busy involved in recriminations, rewriting of history, rethinking of everything, blaming each other again, and not remembering that you actually need to consolidate. You need to move through a transition, not move back, and you need to consolidate. We also need to remember this interim government that we have, the Mushtaq describes this should be an emergency government perhaps, but fortunately is not under a state of emergency. It's being led by people who are respected around the world, but a few weeks ago, some of them were treated as pariahs in Bangladesh. Mm. Professor Yunus, you all know his name, he's our chief advisor, he's a Nobel laureate. There'll be a few more Nobel Peace laureates in a few days who count him as amongst their, their cohort. But in Bangladesh, I faced a situation, we invited, let me give a very personal account so you know how real it is. Uh, just a few months ago, we were celebrating my father's birthday, he's very elderly and rather frail, and he just wanted people he's close to, fond of and respects around him. We invited Professor Yunus amongst about 50 people. Um, that's a small birthday party by Bangladesh standards. Um, Professor Yunus said, I won't come because I don't want to embarrass the people who are there. It would be awkward for many of them who are also friends of his and respecters of his, because it will be embarrassing for them. Photographs will be taken. It will be awkward. I don't want to create that awkwardness. Adil, Adil Rahman Khan, another member of this government, an old friend and comrade of mine and others in the audience here, won, I don't know how many awards he's won for his human rights work in the last many years, many from pretty much every country, because he not quite single-handedly, but almost, documented disappearances and extrajudicial killings over the last 15 years, at great cost to himself, another person who was treated as a pariah, and even worse, actually, uh, 
other human rights activists, feminist leaders, civil society leaders not only wouldn't sign statements in support of Adil when he was being arrested and detained last uh, and incarcerated last year, they actively signed statements protesting the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights speaking out against Adil's detention. That's where we were a few months ago. Others in this government, I think it's worth mentioning, a law advisor, a law professor, who faced not only charges of defamation, not only charges of contempt of court, also charges of sedition and lived with all of this for many years, juggling all of them and, you know, carrying on with his work despite that. Rizwana Hassan, a very courageous climate justice fighter who took on some of these massive, uh, the, the crony capitalists that Mushtaq talked about when they were using their crony capitalism to also devastate the climate uh, and occupy land and, and, and space across the country. Sharmi Murshe, the freedom fighter, you know, who many of you have watched the iconic Nirgan film will see her singing to the freedom fighters back in 1971. So saying this is a government of anti... Uh, Professor Yunus, I should mention again, because this issue has come up in Bangladesh in recent days. Professor Yunus, while a student and a teacher in the US in 1971, was one of those who campaigned for Bangladesh liberation. Uh, it's all documented. So these are not people who are anti-liberation elements. They were for liberation. They fought for it. They're part of it. Um, but now they're being depicted in that way by those who want to undo, I think, what's happened. So I just want to, to get you all to remember this because I think we need to hang on to that before we think about where it is we're going. And I wanted to talk about justice because I think that is the thread that kind of weaves its way through the protests, their prelude and their aftermath now. And that's what really needs to be a priority for us going forward, uh, for all of the hundreds who've lost their lives, for their families and for the thousands Thousands were permanently injured and disabled because of the violence that was carried out against them during these months. But I also think we need to be really aware that the challenges to achieving justice at this time are multiple. And we shouldn't in any way underestimate what those are. There is this moment of high optimism that Mushtaq spoke to, but it is really, it is surrounded by complexity and we have to be really aware of that. Otherwise it's possible to be very glib and say, oh, this is the same as that. Everything is just turned around. It's all reverse. It's all mirror images. It's not quite that. And the reason we have these challenges, we have laws that are not fit for purpose. We have colonial laws, that whole legacy, but we also have a lot of post-colonial shiny new laws made by our governments in the last 50 years that are worse than colonial laws in many ways. We have institutions that are hollowed out and lack independence, lack competence and capacity. We still have an extremely divided society. And most of all, we have a culture of denial and impunity. So as we look for justice for atrocities and we try to establish a just society and reform institutions, we have to be really clear on the scope and enormity of the tasks ahead. Um, I just want to roll back a few seconds before coming to coming back to July and coming back to post July. One of the demands we heard, one of the the kind of clarion calls we heard, if you like, was "We want justice." Um, we want justice is a slogan that we started really hearing back in 2018 during the road safety movement, and it was called out by protesters over and over again. This time, we've seen it plastered on walls across the country. Uh, in 2018, what we saw was, again, young students, university students, but also many school students who came out because they were calling out corruption and criminality that led to horrifyingly high numbers of people dying on our roads because of the lack of necessary safety and, and the enforcement of, of laws. And we saw the same slogan reiterated by the quota reform protesters in their earlier iteration back in 2018. Now, at that time, those protests were crushed. And at that time, it seemed like extreme brutality. We, did, we didn't know what was going to be coming just a few years later. Young people were beaten on the streets by lati-wielding, helmet-wearing men, arrested in their hundreds, and faced charges under draconian laws of hurting the image of the nation. Some were bailed out, but others continued to have cases on their heads for all the years ahead, including up to now. They lost the opportunity to study. Some were forced to give up their jobs or their businesses because the stigma of criminalization was too much to bear with, with both social and material consequences. 
one individual who was singled out during that time. Uh, 2018, if you remember, was before our last set of elections, 2018 elections, and then we had these 2024 ones. Um, an individual who was singled out then and became a symbol of the repression was our friend and client, Dr. Shahid al -Alam. I just want to tell you an example of what happened to him because it happened to countless other people. His one was relatively celebrated and well-known, but it's because I think we need to understand what the processes of injustice are that we've lived with absolutely routinely before we start talking about higher things and, and how we'll achieve justice. So picked up in the middle of the night from his home, carried out after CCTV cameras were disabled, taken in a white van to the detective branch who initially denied that they had him in their custody. He was charged again with that, hurting the image of the nation and contributing to the deterioration of law and order. A hundred days passed before he could be released. And in between we saw, I personally witnessed judge after judge saying they were too embarrassed to hear the matter or just simply refusing his release. Ultimately, after we were able to show the case against him had no basis and the recording that the police played uh, in court of Shahid al so-called offending interview in Al Jazeera didn't match the allegations in the report written by the police, very embarrassing for all of them, but he was and had to be released, but he's had to carry on showing up in court every single month for the last years, including now, he's got another date in a few days, um, because the courts would not go Yet we will not do away the case. Now, his case was a celebrated one with a lot of international support, but other people continued to face prolonged judicial harassment because of what they did back in 2018 in terms of speaking up for justice. One young woman, a pregnant school teacher, had her bail opposed by the government lawyers of that time, 2018, remember, Awami League government, remember, um, even though she was pregnant, carrying, about to give birth, she was suspended from her job as a primary school teacher, remains suspended to this day with a case hanging over her head, again, hurting the image of the nation. A young businesswoman, she lost her partnership running a cafe in, in, in Dhaka, in Dhanmandi, returned to the small town she lived in before, hasn't been able to get it back, hasn't been able to go back to work. A journalist in a Mufassal small town, he was thrown out of his local press club, lost his job. In the end, his family broke up and he's now got uh, severe uh, psychological difficulties that he's facing. Again, they all have cases hanging over their heads. I won't go into more details of that, but what we saw just fast forwarding is these say, those laws were changed into new laws, the Digital Security Act, more and more people faced this kind of extreme and arbitrary repression. And it led to what Mushtaq and Naomi both mentioned, the silencing across civil society, not just of dissenting political voices, uh, of very brave political opposition voices who carried on going to streets, going to demonstrations, knowing they would be facing multiple cases, not just one, but the whole of civil society through this, students, academics, uh, lawyers, journalists, also realized there would be an enormous cost to pay if they were to speak up on anything. Uh, so we saw the silencing out of fear and by design, and I think that's also an important part to talk about. Uh, for many people, many other people, there wasn't fear. They were part of the system, and it wasn't just the crony capitalist. It wasn't just, you know, mega businesses. It wasn't just high officials and politicians. It was unfortunately also people like us, lawyers, academics, journalists, professionals, who were part of constructing a narrative which enabled the system to continue. They didn't only enable the silences, but they spoke and created a story that justified what was happening. Mushtaq talked about the kind of narratives, the binaries around uh, 1971, around liberation, who was seen as pro-liberation, who was seen as anti-liberation. And that was used, uh, as I said, creating pariahs out of Professor Yunus Adel and everybody else, pariahs and criminals. And that's why the justice system became such an important part of this process of continuing uh, not only the violence, but also continuing the silence and continuing the, the possibility of Awami League really ruling for another thousand years, if, if not at least a hundred. Um, so we saw talk shows, newspapers, entirely complicit in this process and amplifying the criminalization of any alternative voices. In January, with this last election, am I on two minutes now? Okay. okay. In January, we saw a real triumphalism after this last uh, so-called election. As I said, the AL seemed like it was going to rule for a thousand years. And there was a sense that that was it, right? It was over. Whatever protests everyone had been involved in, whatever they nurtured in terms of dissenting voices, it wasn't going to happen anymore. And we all felt, I think, inside the country that you'd have to make your accommodations. You'd have to just live with this somehow or the other. So you may as well tone it down, may as well learn how to, how to function. And 
And the international community, of course, also made its peace. We saw quite a lot of um, efforts, particularly by the U.S. prior to prior to uh, January 2024, mm -hmm. to try to encourage these voices about having free and fair elections, you know, having more democratic and civil space. But uh, I think that's now an old footnote about what happened with the U.S. and its engagement. But the rest of the international community, very importantly, didn't really step into the breach. They didn't speak up. They didn't engage. They didn't support the process. And they were like, let's get on, business as usual. So when the quota movement broke out again, it was pretty extraordinary. It really sparked an incredible change. Again, as Mushtaq said, absolutely rightly, it needed that spark. Um, there was enough festering discontent and resentment. And you have to remember an entire generation, people who are in their 20s, who, who've seen election after election come and go. They've never really had a choice. They've never been able to cast a vote. They haven't had anyone to vote for because it's the same cast of characters. There's no contestation. So when the quota movement started, or the way it started this time around, and so I keep saying, I think the justice system is really key to many things. Um, this judgment came out in early June of a court saying, uh, we are reinstating the quota that was canceled back in 2018 by the, the, the prime minister, by Sheikh Hasina at that time. And uh, again, another reminder to everyone, this was a quota reform movement, not a quota abolition movement. People were not saying we will do away with all quotas. We don't believe in equality. They were saying we just don't believe in a quota for grandchildren of freedom fighters from 1971, particularly where freedom fighter itself seems to be a bit of a fluid concept in terms of who gets a certificate and where. There are lots of freedom fighters who have never carried certificates and are do not asking for jobs for their grandchildren or children. And then there are others who turn out to have been 12 or 11 at the time that the war was fought and still seem to have freedom fighter certificates. <laughs> so it's in that context that the movement came up. So this judgment was pronounced in, in early June. Now the judgment, I think it's important not to, to be clear about what it was, what was said. The judgment said, yeah, well, you can reinstate the quota for freedom fighters' children, but the judgment also said the government is free to decide whether it will act on this recommendation or not. Uh, so it was clear from the judgment itself that actually it was for the executive authorities, for the government to take decisions. And the many law students who are part of the leadership of the anti-discrimination student movement more than got that, and they said that right away. They said, please, executive authority, you make your decision. The government then played yet another what it thought were its very clever tricks, which it has played over all these years and gotten away with, uh, precisely because of the, you know, the complicity in the way in which their narratives are amplified in the media and elsewhere. And the government said no. And the prime minister, in fact, she you know, specifically said that. She said, you students, you can carry on protesting on the street or you can wait until the appeal of this case is heard in the court. That's it. There's no other way. It was Patently false. There was no reason for an appeal to be filed. The government could have decided then and there, 5th June night, 6th June morning, they could have sorted this out. They could have negotiated with the students or not. They could have made the decision themselves and come to a satisfactory conclusion. But they didn't. And we roll forward and you've heard about the comments about Razakars. You've heard about the comments about what happened with the killing of Abu Sayyid. After the killing of Abu Sayyid, that actually absolutely brought together the entire country. I did hear... Um, People I, I know and who are well respected, again, as I said, as feminist leaders and civil society leaders, still saying, even after Abu Said's death, is, but you know, he was a he was a Shibi, he was a Jamaat person. I did. I, I'll tell you later who they were. Um, and the point is, the rest of the country just didn't accept that anymore. We didn't care if it was a Shibi person or a Jamaat person. We just can't shoot someone like that in cold blood and think it's okay. And so I think that was a huge, huge turning point. And the next day, uh, when the government announced a judicial inquiry, next day or a couple of days later, when they announced a judicial inquiry commission and they announced the name of a judge who's... <laughs> main career has been in the Attorney General's office, and who was one of the judges I remembered rather well, because he was one of the ones who was very embarrassed and refused to hear our case when he went with Shahid al-Alam's bail petition all these years ago. When they appointed him as a Judicial Inquiry Commission, it was like, oh, this is not serious, really, nothing is going to happen. And then, of course, with the day's hiatus after that, the killings began, the curfew began, and so on. After that, in the middle of that process, uh, suddenly, the six uh, leading uh, six of the leading coordinators of the student movement were picked up. Three of them from a hospital while they were under treatment. One of them, just a matter of days after he had already been taken in and tortured to the extent his entire arm and entire thigh were purple, black, blue, and purple. They were taken from the hospital and again taken back to the detective branch office, few hundred, few minutes from my home, as it happens. 
So two, at that point, um, that's, I guess, when I got involved with the process much more directly. I guess we'd all been there, you know, cheering from the wings and going to talk shows, doing that kind of thing, but nothing much more. A bunch of us in the high court were saying, we have to do something about this. What can we do? So we have got to do something to get these six of the challenge, the detention of these six. Then others said, we've got to do more than that. This firing is just going on day by day by day. We can't accept it. So two lawyers um, uh, came together and said, we're just going to file any petition, whatever petition. I said, fine, bring it. They brought a petition, terribly written, I confess, to the entire room. Awfully written, full of mistakes, not terribly well, uh, really, honestly, not well put out. So I was first saying, please, I'm not going to stand up with this. Go away and rewrite it. And they're saying, we don't have time. We have 10 more minutes before the court's going to stop taking new petitions. You've got to go. I said, OK, we'll see what we can do. Run. And they ran and they were refused by several courts. They finally got into one courtroom and the judge was fantastic. I said, unfortunately, he's now being punished for supposedly not giving a good judgment. He showed incredible courage and said, come, I'll hear you. Come by 12 o'clock, bring your team, get in there. We got in there. Out of us, out of our team, two people were freedom fighters, genuine card carrying, no certificate bearing freedom fighters. <laughs> they came with us to the room. By the time we reached the courtroom at 12, there, it was not like this. There was no standing room space even. The whole space had been taken over, not by our supporters, not by students, not by friendly lawyers, but by the entire Attorney General's office. Every single person from every single court had been summoned by message, be in Court 23 immediately. So for the first time, I've never experienced this in 30 years of practice. None of us on our team, including our two septuagenarian freedom fighting senior advocates were given seating for that entire morning. We had to stand the entire time while we made our arguments and we were barracked. I got shouts from a former minister who's now in custody uh, saying I was a war criminal and a friend of war criminals. Our freedom fighter senior advocates were told that they wanted the destruction of the country and that they were seditious. And these kinds of shouts and catcalling and so on went on throughout, throughout the hearing. Anyway, that went on for several days, but the importance of this judgment, as we heard, uh, sorry, this, this is proceedings later, were, as we found out later, that um, they gave a sense to the protesters that, in fact, the law was on their side. What they were saying was right, because on the very first day, the judge said at one point to the Attorney General's office representatives who were claiming that these students had been arrested, not had not been arrested, the students had been taken in because they had sought protection from the authorities. And these pictures were there all over our television screens showing the six coordinators being fed chow mein or some kind of noodle by the, by the detective branch office, uh, the senior officer. At that point, the judge said, are you having us on? He said this literally to the Attorney General's office, and that was broadcast as a top headline in all of the all of the media. And I think that made it clear to everybody: this is absurd. You know, this talk of going to courts, going to judges, playing with the law. Everyone saw it. It was just a complete farce. You couldn't take it seriously at all. And the second thing that the judges did for us is they allowed us during those four days of hearings to go out there and address the press every single day. And then everything that was said by those two lawyers, who were the petitioners, and all of us, you know, got got amplified again. So, uh, and it ended, the case ended on the Sunday. For the, the days the, cases, the case was going on, they didn't fire. The day the case ended, uh, as, the case, as the case was, and as the hearing was ending, the Attorney General's office people all around the room were shouting, reject, reject, reject. The court unfortunately did reject, but it also gave a set of directions saying firing can only happen and with strict compliance with particular guidance that they laid down, which is already in our legislation. But the AG's office went out there and for any of you who use Facebook, they all posted up these messages, red box messages saying rejected, rejected. And they went out and briefed the press straight away saying it's rejected. By the time we went out five minutes later, there was already firing all around. We could hear it and we had to go inside uh, to escape from that. So that, that was the situation we were in. That was the 4th of August. On the 4th of August, there was an enormously high death toll, over 100, as that firing continued. On the 5th of August, as you know, there was an enormously high death toll that continued for hours, even after Sheikh Hasina fled the country. Uh, so... I think I now should wrap up two minutes. Yes, yeah, so I'll wrap up with the future in two minutes, having taken you through the history. Um, 
where do we go now? What, what happens now? Uh, a lot has happened in these three months. I think the demand for justice, uh, and I won't go into the period between the 4th and the 8th before the interim government took office, because that was, again, a, a real crisis. We saw that Sheikh Hasina was given security to leave the country, and I, th I think personally that was right, because I think there would have been uh, you know, I think anything would have happened to her at that point. She said there's no way her safety, safety could have been uh, ensured. Uh, but I think what was not right was that the military that ensured the safety of Sheikh Hasina did nothing to ensure the safety of ordinary citizens, uh, certainly not of property, but not of ordinary people right across the country. So we saw for four days, I, I have to say, we were all euphoric. We were in the university area, it was much singing, uh, and many other songs being sung. But... Um, by about five o'clock, we're not singing anymore. Our petitioner in that case was back in front of the cameras saying there are attacks on minorities in different parts of the country. This has to stop. We have to all come together. People were very aware of what was happening and how wrong it was. Uh, Bongo Buntu's house in road number 32 was burnt down, a critical part of our history, not acceptable to most people, I think, in this protest. Some people may think it's fine. I think most people don't. But those things happened. The military, the police had disappeared, having shot at people for all these days, uh, many of them and the military were not in sufficient numbers, and no one was directing ensuring security for all. But after the interim government took office, one of the first uh, announcements that was made was that a priority agenda for them would be to ensure justice, to, for justice for July, justice for all those massacred and, and all those uh, arrested, detained, and tortured. What have we seen since, though? We've seen a very patchy situation. We're seeing a discussion still around what will be the effective processes for justice. Will they be ordinary criminal courts? Will they be murder cases? Uh, that is a really problematic area. And we're seeing these kind of wholesale cases being filed, which is very much the culture of the past. Uh, with with the, In one case, I've seen with 700 people accused. Um, maybe, I don't know, all, all parliamentarians are in that case, for example. Uh, other cases with 400, 500, 300. Uh, all the Wami League leadership in a particular section of the country or a particular constituency, the MP, whether or not he was a perfectly peaceable MP whose worst crime was not speaking up, but certainly not being directly complicit in any kind of killing or the atrocity. Um, so we're seeing all of those cases, uh, which clearly are, you know, an abuse of power and abusive process. Uh, we're also seeing discussions about whether to hold case, whether to hold these trials before the International Crimes Tribunal, which has a very checkered history uh, in terms of the trial of war criminals. We're seeing bizarre contradictions now with people who was completely happy to support the trial of war criminals, indeed many of whom uh, campaigned on the streets for the invocation of the death penalty against them, who now are not able to criticize the ICT because they supported every single thing that happened under the ICT, but realize that if it's used in its, in its existing formation against army league leaders it will certainly lead to atrocities as it has done in the past and 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 will lead to it will lead to gross violations of human rights so people are trying to reconstruct that and see how it can work and there's some more muted discussions about whether there are possibilities of of international justice of going before the international criminal court or even looking at possibilities of pursuing some of the the top leadership and some of those who were involved in directing and planning and coordinating these uh, these um killings abroad, because of course many of the senior leadership, it seems, are no longer in the country and are beyond justice in Bangladesh. And what very important last part, I think, just two last points. Um, for us in Bangladesh, justice is often, the discussions about justice have often been around only and exclusively around criminal accountability and around punishment. Uh, and very much, you know, this is also a popular slogan, unfortunately, we want to hang X or Y or whatever. It's very important, I think, to look away from that and, and look more broadly at what justice means, that it also means a search for truth. And it also means reparations for the victims. It means memorialization, understanding what's happened. There are many lessons for us from 1971 also. But in 1970, we didn't get the piece around criminal accountability right. Maybe we didn't in the end ultimately get that right till now. But we did do many things around reparations. There were efforts to meet the needs of Birangona, for example, women who were subjected to sexual violence in 71. There were other efforts that were made at that time to understand how to stand by victims. And I think those lessons are being learned now as well. We have a justice, uh, a foundation that has been set up by the government for the survivors and for the families of, of the victims of, of July. 
the foundation finally, after much uh, advocacy from from students and from others, it's got uh, it. It started making uh, immediate financial payments to victims' families. Not enough, not sufficient. This has to be more systematically done. But it's begun. It's it's been reaching out to people, uh, to victim families. Uh, it's finally got you know it's got people who engage with the process. Um, uh, which, which and it, that's taken a long time coming. There's still enormous amounts to do. The numbers are huge in terms of how we have to respond and who we have to respond to. But we need to, I think, understand, and I think this is what everyone has said before me as well, how do we come together at this point to move through this transition to the kind of Bangladesh we want to be? I don't think we can do it by simply saying, let's reset and go back to the past. That's uh, for Bangladeshis, you'll understand, I think, my use of the word reset in this context. And I think we we need to do a reset that allows us to revision 71 and the moment of liberation in a way that brings everyone together. It is not one family story and it's not one party story. Yes, the Awami League led the independence movement, but many others were part of it. One of our, we're, we're talking a lot about the rise of fundamentalist forces, the rise of communal forces, uh, exclusionary processes, you, women who are part of the, the student movement now no longer being visible in policy spaces and all of these multiple reform agendas that are going on. All of that is happening and we have to battle that and we have to fight that. But I think we have to fight that now. What we see a lot, in, I, th I feel, in Bangladesh going on at the moment is an attempt to attempt to pretend, as I said, that these what happened three months ago simply didn't happen. So the people who we have traditionally seen being, as I said, our human rights leaders and our civil society voices, I speak about them because that's the space I work in, are suddenly, and people who would rush to any kind of you know atrocity that they see happening and stand in solidarity with people, they're not the people rushing to stand with the students. They suddenly don't seem to see the victims of July, but they see all of the victims of post 5th July. And I think it's really in 5th July onwards. And I think we have to break that, right? We have to see what happened before 5th July, but we also have to see what's happened from 5th July onwards. We can't deny that. There have been attacks, there have been atrocities on minorities, on others, and political reprisals. And we have to see how we address all of that. And there are no easy solutions, but I think we have to do that. Just one sentence more. Uh, uh, sorry, Sami, one sentence more. I think that two, two things that give, there are many things that give me hope as well as many things that give sleepless nights right now. Um, but, but just two symbolic things maybe. One is the song that um, Mushtaq played, where he was getting very teary, I noticed, as, as were many of us perhaps. Um, that's a song from before 1971, when he said it's a nationalist song, it's a nationalist song from pre-partition days. It's written by Dijendrula Roy. It was sung by all of the students, all of the activists, all of the protesters. Uh, it's Dhanudhani Pushpe Bhara. It's about the beauty of Bengal and, you know, connection with, with the land and, and the, the country and the, uh, and the landscape. So I think that's a song that has a very long and deep history, right? It speaks to Bangladesh, the current Bangladesh. Yes, the Bangladesh of majority of Bengali Muslims, but also the Bangladesh, which is not only of Bengalis, also the Bangladesh, which is not only of Muslims, is a Bangladesh of Hindus, Christians, and dare I say, non-believers and even atheists. It's a Bangladesh, which is of heterosexual and LGBT people. It's a Bangladesh which is a people of disabilities. It's definitely a Bangladesh of the students and the new generation. It's also a Bangladesh of older middle-aged people and older people. So I think it's that inclusive Bangladesh that we want. And one of the many wall graffitis that you see around Dhaka and around all of our cities at the moment, actually, is a graffiti of a, a woman in a, in a hijab. And some of them are a woman in a niqab, actually, walking. And she's walking hand in hand with another girl who's in a T-shirt and trousers. And both of them are bearing, I might cry now, the flag of Bangladesh. And that's the Bangladesh I think we want to see. And that's the Bangladesh we have to reclaim and fight for. And it is too early to give up and say, let's go back to 4th of August. Thank you. Okay, I am sure that there are going to be many, many, many questions. I am going to be brutal in my timekeeping with the questions. You will be allowed to speak for a maximum of one minute. And if there's anyone on Zoom who has questions, please um, put it in the chat box, though we might not, in fact, get to that, um, get to Zoom, because we've got such little time. Okay, 
Um, we've got a lady over here who was very first. There's a roving microphone coming to you. Well, I could speak for an hour, but I won't. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of things I would like to discuss with Mushtaq, but in private. Um, for now, we agree and disagree on a lot of matters. We know each other from education days. Um, but coming to the last point that Sarah raised, uh, you know, about an inclusive society that we want, all sides coming together. I think this is a point I made a year ago at the Liberation War Museum in Bangladesh, that 50 years on, we need to come together because we're all children of the same parents, families, and so on. The issue is how do we get about it? If we, if we have followed the movement a little bit more, you know, the issue of the Shibi as aspect and the fact that these youngsters had literally gone into hiding, right? And like Trojan horses came out saying we were actually Shibi in order to keep the unity of the movement. That means they knew that had they come in their own name, they wouldn't have had support. So that is a background that we have to take into consideration as to how to build on from that for the future. I leave my question with that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to take that, address that or shall I? But what was the question? In one sentence, how do we, as I understand it, how do we actually move on from this moment? How, how do you actually come together even then, until now, people have been working in secret. So was there a kind of a plan behind it, a very long-term movement coming to this stage rather than something that just happened? There are many, many, many ways I'm going to go. <laughs> Maybe you should take some more as well while we oh, think about okay. the answer. All right, that one sounds like it needs a bit of thinking. The uh, woman in the pink here. And please keep it very short. We've got five more minutes. It's easy. Yes. Hi, I'm Noshin. I'm currently pursuing MSc in public policy in UCL. So it's more like I just wanted to share one thing because my entire summer was in Dhaka. So I met Sarah for quite a number of times uh, after post-revolution, actually. So my younger brother, who's 17, he was apparently shot. Um, I and Sarapa lives in the same neighborhood, Bailey Road. I just wanted to mention this thing uh, because in you know, how many layers the violence happened. My brother was denied initial treatment in three of the most famous hospitals. Oh I think we demand justice from that as well. Yeah. My brother was not kept in the post-operative unit after surgery because police might take him to the custody. Police were literally grabbing, you know, students who were injured from the hospital beds. We had to take our brother back at home five minutes after the surgery during the blackout period. And also, after even coming back home, we could not sleep for two weeks. I mentioned it to Sarapa before as well, because every night there was block raids. Mm -hmm. Students were being dragged from home who apparently had injuries, who apparently had operation marks like stitches on their body. So I'm a, a lawyer in profession, so just wanted to mention in how many layers the injustice mm. happened to the students. Mm. Thank you, everyone. Okay, does anyone have a question? Um, we had a gentleman here with the hat. Yeah. Please okay. give it to a question, if you could. Yeah, it's a question, actually, because one good thing that's happened is that uh, the narrative has changed. That's probably the most critical thing. We no longer have to rely on 1971 narrative. I can now talk about my father's um, um, encounter with, with uh, Mujib as a mustan, or as a student. Um, so I, I, can, I can say things like that. What's the question? The question is this. Why are we still relying on the narratives being developed by NGOs in foreign lands? I think this is the most difficult thing for me because people talk about knowledge of history of revolutions. Who remembers the French Revolution? Who remembers Everyone. October? Revolution? Okay, well, I, I think um... some, of the, some of the style of uh, talk is as if, you know, we're repeating the French Revolution here. In fact, this has just been, this is just a, how can I put it, an interim government. There has not been a proper revolution here. 
And uh, so I'm going to turn over to the okay. speakers to no, see if there's any response. It's not a revolution. It's not a revolution because there's been no, no. It's been a regime change, sure, and an uprising. But I'm not quite sure what the NGO uh, discourse has to do with it. But anyway. I'd be really surprised if the change in the narrative is the most important thing that's happened here. Really, very surprised. Um, if there are there no more responses, then I'll no, take some more no questions. More uh, there was a gentleman up there. I've got a real question. It's like, <laughs> uh, observe that you say uh, about the Mahfouz Alam philosophy. Oh, it's okay. I'm quite loud. <laughs> <laughs> no, for the uh, for the online people. Please keep it. We, we're we're literally going to be kicked out of this room very so, soon. So, so I just want to know what is the philosophy that uh, you are a Muslim, but you are a secular. Well, what is that philosophy that Mahfuz Alam and all are pursuing? That is important to know. What is the actual? What is actually this philosophy? You can give a name, but that philosophy is not there actually. That's a concrete question. Are you able to answer that? In this, yes. No, I would uh, suggest you read Mahfuz Alam. He's written quite a lot, and uh, so I think what the, the young people are saying now is that the time has come to reimagine the state and the. Did you understand that? Please, please allow. Yes, I I did understand it, but it would take me a long time to explain to you. But I think that this is a, a process where we are, which, which is so exciting for me to see that for once young people are trying to reimagine their country and not having people tell them what is the ideology, what is the narrative they must follow. And this reimagining of their own identity is super exciting. Thank you very much. Look, we are going to end here because we're actually out of time. And I'd just like to end on a historical moment like this raises questions, more questions than we could possibly answer in a year, let alone in this seminar. Please thank our panelists and the South Asia Institute for beginning the conversation. Thank you.